Good morning. I'm just thinking to myself there, the last time I was up here, I couldn't see your pretty faces for the masks. You're a much better looking bunch than I thought, so it's, it's really lovely to be here. And if you're visiting this morning in First Corey, and you're doubly welcome if you're on holiday, hope you have a good time. I uh, hope the weather improves because it hasn't really been very pleasant this last week with heavy showers and wind and cold and stuff. But anyway, sure it's good to be alive and to be able to get out and about uh, and to breathe that fresh air. James uh, and Janice are off for a, a wee break, uh, so uh, we'll be filling in for him over these next couple of Sundays as well. You've drawn the short straw, I'm sorry. Our call to worship is the one that we've been using throughout this year, Revelation 5, verse 12, and it's a responsive call. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and praise. Is he worthy? He is. Let's join together to sing then uh, the story of our wonderful Saviour. I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. We'll stand and sing. Let's join our hearts in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it's lovely to be here together this morning to worship you. We are so glad to have the opportunity of coming to express our um, love, our gratitude 
for all that you have done for us in the Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, our Saviour. And we are glad to sing that wondrous story of the Christ who died for us. If it were not for him, we would be lost. We would be facing what many people used to describe as an undone eternity. But with Jesus, we have forgiveness for our sin. We have life eternal. We have hope beyond the grave. And yet, Lord, even with our desire to be here and our gladness of being here, yet throughout the days of the week, there are many times when we have no thought for you, where we leave you out of situations in which we find ourselves, where we take to ourselves responsibilities really that are not ours to take. And we're sorry, Lord, for that. It's so easy to keep you at arm's length. It's so easy to just plow on regardless without giving you your place. And we want to say sorry genuinely, Lord, for that today. We praise you that as we come and confess our sin, that you are just and faithful to forgive all our sin, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness in Jesus. Where would we be without him? Where would we be without you, our Heavenly Father, tending to us, sharing your love upon us, being gracious to us? So we pray, Lord, that over the weeks of the summer months in which we tend to be more relaxed in our everyday lives, where we take breaks away from home, perhaps on a holiday to a foreign destination or just up the road in the caravan, or um, we pray, Lord, that you will help us not to leave you out of the picture. And not just to kind of give you a place on a Sunday for an hour, but that we would live our lives constantly knowing that you are with us, pointing others to you in all that we say, all that we do. Help us to worship you, Lord, with our everyday lives, presenting them to you as offerings of worship. May you be pleased, Lord, for we ask it all in Jesus' name. Let's sing a little chorus together that reminds us about who God is. He is Abba, our Father. Let's stand and sing.
Punctuation's a wonderful thing, isn't it? We're very careless about our commas and our full stops and uh, semicolons and cones and stuff this year. Some of you probably don't even know what I'm talking about when I say all those things, but do you notice that chorus that if you take a break in the wrong, wrong place, you completely change the meaning of it? Abba, Father, let me be. Huh? No, Abba, Father, let me be yours and yours alone. So don't take a break at the end of the line, otherwise you completely change the meaning of it. Young folks, do you want to, uh, sorry, you can come up and join me. I know there's only one or two about this morning, but maybe you'll get ready to come up after we do our Bible reading here. It's Luke chapter 9, verses 1 to 17. I see a few of you dotted around the place, so please come up and join me at the front, otherwise I'll be very lonely up here. Luke chapter 9, verses 1 to 17. Let's hear God's word. When Jesus had called the twelve together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. He told them, Take nothing for the journey, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra tunic. Whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that town. If people do not welcome you, shake the dust of your feet when you leave their town as a testimony against them. So they set out and went from village to village, preaching the gospel and healing people everywhere. Now, Herod the Tetrarch heard about all that was going on, and he was perplexed because some were saying that John had been raised from the dead, others that Elijah had appeared, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago had come back to life. But Herod said, I beheaded John. Who then is this I hear such things about? And he tried to see him. When the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus what they had done. Then he took them with him, and they withdrew by themselves to a town called Bethsaida. But the crowds learned about it and followed him. He welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed healing. Late in the afternoon, the twelve came to him and said, Send the crowd away so they can go to their surrounding villages and countryside and find food and lodging, because we are in a remote place here. Jesus replied, You give them something to eat. They answered, We have only five loaves of bread and two fish, unless we go and buy food for all this crowd. About five thousand men were there. But Jesus said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. The disciples did so and everybody sat down. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke them. Then he gave them to the disciples to set before the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. We thank God for his word. Pray it here, bless it to us for Jesus' sake. Amen. Good to see you. Well, you're on your holidays, aren't you? Yeah. You obviously haven't gone away yet because you're still here. But are you going to go away? Anywhere nice? Scotland. Scotland. Oh, you'll have to talk with your best Scottish accent when you go there. <laughs> Anywhere else? Anywhere further afield? Where are you hither? Tenerife. Oh. <gasps> Oh, the sunshine, what, it'll be lovely. Ireland. Ireland, very good. I hope whenever, I hope you're going well south now because the weather gets better the further down you go. Good. Oh, that sounds lovely. You'll bring us back something, won't you? <laughs> and where are you going? Donegal, just across the bay there, yes. Well, I hope you all have a good time. We went away one year. Uh, abroad, We don't often go abroad, but we went away one summer and the hotel that we were staying in was on the side of a hill. We have a picture of it here for you to see, hopefully. There you go. Look at the hill with all the trees on it behind the hotels there. Maybe some of you might recognize the spot if you've ever been there. And the weather was gorgeous. There was a, a pharmacy down the street that we walked past every day 
and it would have the temperature up on a sign outside. And it was always 34, 35, 36. And there was no shelter, there was no shade or anything to go in. And we were parboiled, because we were used to Northern Ireland, and 35 degrees was very hot. But still, we enjoyed the holiday, until one day, we became quite scared. We were at our hotel, and suddenly, across the hillside from us, there was smoke. And there seemed to be a wee bit of a panic on with the people who were living there, because there was houses quite close to where this fire was, and in the bushes and the, tr and the trees. So they, they very quickly started to try to put the fire out. And then the next thing was, a fire brigade arrived, and they helped to put out the fire. But then we noticed that there was smoke further up the hillside. In fact, right at the top of the hill, there was quite a lot of smoke starting to billow out into the sky. And with our hotel being right among the trees, we thought, oh, this mightn't be very good. Because if this fire develops, it could come down the hillside to where we're staying. But thankfully, there was somebody there to rescue us. Because there was a little plane came over. And what was the pilot of the plane doing? He was dropping water down onto the fire on the top of the hill. And he would scoop down into the, the, uh, the water, the sea uh, below us, and scoop up water, fly up round, and then release it down onto the fire. But I thought to myself, well, you're probably thinking the same thing. It's a very small plane, isn't it? It wouldn't carry much water. You might get a bucket or two of water into that, but not an awful lot. So the big guns came along after that, a helicopter, and it had a huge big thing underneath it, and he would go down and scoop up the seawater and fly over, and very quickly, actually, after three or four runs, Thankfully, the smoke subsided and we thought we're safe again. But there we were in a place we'd never been to before and we were quite scared, frightened about what might happen. But then we thought, well, I thought of a song that we would often sing and it's a song that children would often sing. And one of the verses says this, in any place you go to, our Father God is there. He knows what you're thinking. He listens to each prayer. And the chorus of it says, talk to God and share with him the things you do each day. Tell him what's on your mind. He loves to hear you pray. So if you find yourself in a situation like we were, a bit scared, a bit frightened of what might, what might happen, Talk to God and tell him about your fears. Tell him that you're a bit frightened and ask him to help you because he loves to hear you pray and he loves to answer your prayer and come and help you wherever you might be in the world. Let's pray to him just now, shall we? Heavenly Father, thank you for your loving care for each one of us. No matter where we go in this world, you are there. And so over the summer, as we go to various places on our holidays, we pray, Lord, that you will help us to remember that you are with us, that you will never leave us. And that even at times we perhaps become scared because we've never been to this place before or, or something frightening happens while we're there. Help us, Lord, to talk to you and to share with you the things that are going on in our lives so that we might know your help coming to us each day. We ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Thanks for coming up and joining me this morning. You're heading out to Children's Church just now, and everybody else is going to sing another song together. And it's a song that reminds us that we can trust in the Lord, and that when our trust is in Him, on Jesus Christ, then we're on solid ground. Everything else is sinking sand, but we can really put our trust in Him. We'll stand and sing.
Let's pray together for a moment. Father, open our eyes that we may see wonderful things from your word. For Jesus' sake. First Korean folks will know that James' summer series is looking at a few of the songs of the kingdom as he is entitled and found, of course, in the Old Testament book of Psalms. And he began with Psalm 1 two Sundays ago, and Adam Wallace led us through an excellent study of Psalm 121 last week. So I thought we would do Psalm 119 today. <laughs> Only two of them. Psalm 121, of course, begins, I look to the hills. Where does my help come from? Hills are really uh, important things in the Bible. Hillsides appear again and again and again, especially in the Gospels, when Jesus was moving around Galilee and Judea, teaching and preaching and uh, healing people. Hillsides occur, they crop up again and again and again. So I thought we could use a more recently composed song of the kingdom to focus our thoughts on three hillsides, three events that take place on hillsides in Luke's gospel. The song reminds us of the incredible promise that while we weren't part of the crowds that saw Jesus when the events took place, nevertheless, we shall see Jesus just as they saw him when he returns in power and glory to wrap up this sinful world and establish the new heaven and the new earth that will become the eternal home of everyone who has ever trusted him and lived for him as Savior and Lord. So we begin the hillside events then in Luke chapter 9. It's a, it was amazing, wasn't it, to see the huge numbers of people who gathered in London over the Queen's Jubilee weekend, hoping to catch a glimpse of her as she appeared on the balcony in Buckingham Palace following the trooping of the colour. The, the cameras caught it for us, and it was like a tsunami of people coming down the mall towards the palace. Just crowds and crowds of people didn't last very long. She wasn't actually on the balcony all that long. And yet people were talking about how lovely she looked and, and how glad they were to get to see her even for such a short time. <laughs> Mind you, I think a certain trio of young children stole some of the limelight, didn't they? Well, I guess people felt pretty much the same way when Jesus was moving around Judea and Galilee a couple of thousand years ago. Just to get a glimpse of him, to see him in the flesh, to hear him for themselves. Well, they'd often find themselves on a hillside where he could be seen and heard by everyone listening to Jesus as he taught them and witnessing the events that took place while they were there. Diane Wilkinson has captured the scene on three different hillsides, quite powerfully, I think, in her song entitled, We Shall See Jesus. Verse one says this, once on a hillside, people were gathered, hoping to see him as thousands were fed. He touched the blind eyes, healed broken spirits, moved with compassion. He raised up the dead. Doesn't that describe the scene that we read earlier in Luke chapter 9? The story of how Jesus provided for such a huge crowd of people, over 5,000 of them. People who followed uh, him to the hills surrounding a pretty isolated village called Bethsaida, a few miles from Capernaum on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. Luke tells us, in verse 11, that Jesus welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed healed. The crowd was so taken with what they were hearing and seeing that nobody was in any rush away. They didn't seem to care about the fact that they had 
uh, been away from home for most of the day and hadn't had anything to eat. You ever find yourself in that kind of situation? I, I do constantly. Sandra always thinks there's something wrong with me because I would never really feel hungry. So if I start to do a job uh, around the house or out in, in the garden or something, I'll just work until it's finished and then I'll take something to eat. But I would never stop halfway through because I always feel it interrupts the whole process and you know, ah, you have to set it down, you have to clean up and then you have to go back and no, just get on with it, do it and then have something to eat. And it was a bit like that for these people that day. They, they had gone out to see Jesus, maybe they hadn't intended to stay there all day, but they found themselves intrigued and drawn in by what he was saying and what he was doing. And so they just stayed. Food somehow seemed irrelevant compared to being in the company of Jesus. Interestingly, it wasn't the crowd who raised the issue of food. Have you ever noticed that? It wasn't the crowd that raised the issue, it was the disciples. Maybe that's why Jesus replied to them the way that he did. You give them something to eat. Do you know, it was as if he was saying, well, if you're so interested in the fact that they haven't had any food, you, you give them some. I can't help but picture Jesus saying that with a bit of a wry smile on his face. Seeing as how you're so concerned about them going without food, you feed them. Well, that got them into a bit of a slutter. But we've only got five loaves and, and, and two fish. And, and you surely couldn't be suggesting that, that we should go into some of the larger towns around here and buy food for them. Have you seen the number of them? The disciples don't appear to have made the connection between this situation and their own experience described by Luke in the early part of the chapter as they travelled around Galilee without staff, bag, bread, money or fresh clothes. It must have come as quite a shock to them when Jesus said to them, okay men, it's time for you to get a bit of practical experience in ministry for yourselves. Away you go into the towns and villages of Galilee and preach the gospel and heal the sick. Now, I can imagine that the disciples responded to that with a good deal of trepidation. I mean, think about it. What if I were to say to you, all of you here this morning, right, we've spent enough time listening to sermons and talking in discussion groups. It's time to do something practical. So I want some of you to go to McCosquin, some to Articliff, some to Castle Rock, some to Ballybogie, some to Port Stewart, some to Port Rush, some to Ballymoney, and you're going to preach the gospel and heal the sick. How would you feel? Well, some of you might rub your hands and say, well, it's about time I was able to use my gifts to share the gospel out there. Others of you might kind of look very nervously at the person sitting beside you and saying, is he serious? Jesus was serious. He meant every word of what he said and the disciples knew it. They didn't argue. They didn't say, but, 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 but. There's a very simple reason for no objection. Verses 1 and 2, when Jesus had called the 12 together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases, and he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. He gave them power and authority. To do what? To do what he had been doing. Their ministry was an extension of his. And the effects were amazing. People everywhere, including King Herod himself, were talking about what was happening. This was more than just an evening's door-to-door -door work. Remember, they were traveling around Galilee on foot. 
No cars or public transport in those days. They'd have walked from village to village. And by the looks of it, they had a few overnight stays along the way. So we don't know how long it was before they met up with Jesus again to report about how they had got on. And we don't know what Jesus was doing while they were away. But two things we do know. Two important things for us to remember in the course of our daily lives as Christian men, women and young people and as a congregation involved in the work of the kingdom in our day and generation. First, we will only be effective in the work of the kingdom where the Lord confers his power and authority upon us in that work. It's interesting to note here in Luke 9, I think, that there's no mention of gifts. Luke doesn't say that Jesus gave them the gift of preaching or the gift of healing and sent them out. He gave them power and authority and sent them out to preach and heal. To preach the good news of the kingdom and to heal the sick. Why no talk of gifts? Because I believe Jesus wanted them to realize and us to learn that it was only through his power and authority that they could do the things that they would be doing. And it's still that way today. You see, when we put the focus first and foremost on gifts, it's all too easy to get a bit full of ourselves, using our gifts to our own benefit, to gain influence over others, to make ourselves look holier and more spiritual than others, or than we really are. Paul had to take the Christians in Corinth to task for that kind of behavior, as we see in his first letter to them. The truth is, as the disciples discovered in their first tentative steps in ministry, it's as our abilities are combined with the power and authority from the Lord that things happen. Lives are changed. Habits are broken. Relationships are transformed. And the kingdom of God extended. We could use our gifts till we're blue in the face. But without the Lord's power and authority behind them, we accomplish very little. And the second thing we learn from the disciples' experience here in Luke 9, <coughs> Christians don't do the things we do, live the way we live, to draw attention to ourselves, but to point people to Jesus. What were people talking about as the disciples went about their task? Then? No. They were trying to work out who their master was. Verse 8. Some were saying that John had been raised from the dead. Others that Elijah had appeared. And still some that one of the prophets of long ago had come back to life. And who did Herod want to see for himself? The disciples? No. Verse 7 tells us that Herod had heard all about what they were doing. All that was going on. But it was Jesus who became the focus of his curiosity. Verse 9. Herod said, I beheaded John. Who then is this I hear such things about? And he tried to see him. Who do people see when they look at the things we do? The lives that we live? Ourselves? Or Jesus? As people around us look at the way we live our lives, it should make them want to find out more about the one in whose name we do what we do. Jesus. The power and authority of Jesus as Lord should be obvious in our lives. Even if they aren't aware of who Jesus is, they should still see his influence 
stamped across our lives clearly and powerfully, leading them to ask themselves, how do we do that? Why do we live the way we live? How do we live the way we live? Are we promoting ourselves or Jesus? There's something for us to reflect on for a wee while later on over lunch, isn't it? Sadly, back on the hillside where thousands of people were gathered to see Jesus, the disciples hadn't entirely grasped these things. They hadn't joined up the dots between their ministry experience around Galilee and the situation on the hillside. All they could see were thousands of hungry people. But what they didn't see was that if Jesus could provide for his disciples' needs, couldn't he do the same for everyone else? Of course he could. And so he used the situation as yet another teaching point for the disciples. His tongue-in-cheek remark about you feed them was aimed at opening their eyes to what he could do with what they had to offer which on this occasion was the five loaves and two fish that a young lad's mother had given him as a packed lunch for the day out to see Jesus. To buy bread for everyone would have been completely beyond their means. Yet Jesus demonstrated that in his hands, even something as seemingly insignificant as a packed lunch can be used to amazing effect. Not only were all the people fed, but 12 baskets full of leftovers were collected. You know, folks, time and again, we find ourselves faced with situations of need. And I'm not just thinking about the victims of natural disasters or deadly conflicts around the world from time to time. I'm not just thinking about the people in countries where famine has taken hold, where disease and starvation is an, an everyday reality, where clean water is in short supply, if available at all. As individuals, we don't have sufficient resources to meet those needs, nor can we as a congregation hope to do so. But we can add our packed lunches, as it were, to all the other packed lunches offered to the Lord by the members of the worldwide Church of Jesus Christ to make up an offering that can be used by the Lord to accomplish more than we could ever imagine possible. Yet, you know, there are plenty of situations in which we can help people right on our own doorsteps. I quite like watching DIY SOS, The Big Build on television. I think it's a great show. I never know how they can do what they do in nine days. And I would always like to go back six months later and see what the house is like. Because I was always told you don't put kitchen units against a dump freshly plastered wall until it's completely dried out. And you don't put tiles in the floor until you've tested it for weeks and see what the moisture content in them is. Nine days. Maybe the tiles are falling off the wall in six months. I don't know. But I love the program, nevertheless. And I would love to be involved in something like that. But Nick Knowles normally ends the program with words like, maybe you know someone who needs your help. could be providing a bit of company for someone who's lonely, fixing a dripping tap, helping with childminding, doing some ironing, cleaning out a blocked drain, taking stuff to the amenity site, washing a car, giving someone a lift, passing on a pair of shoes or trainers or some clothes that are still in really good condition for free 
to a family that's finding it hard to make ends meet. There are any amount of opportunities out there to do something for other people, not for any kudos or benefit for ourselves or to make ourselves look holier and more spiritual than others, but out of love for Jesus and a concern for others. The resources we have as individuals, as families and as fellowships aren't simply ours to use whatever way we fancy. They're given to us by the Lord not just to provide for ourselves, but to provide for his work and to help with the needs of others. There's a very real sense in which each of us is faced with the suggestion Jesus made to his disciples in Luke 9, 13. You give them something to eat. Are we willing to do that? God so loved the world that he gave the best thing that he had to save us, his only son. We who have received so much from the Lord ought to reflect his generosity in our attitudes and behavior in every area of daily life. When we do, The Lord will use what we offer, however insignificant it may appear to be, to accomplish something worthwhile in the life of another individual or family or nation to the glory of Jesus. The chorus of Diane Wilkinson's song says, We shall see Jesus just as they saw him. There is no greater promise than this. When he returns in power and glory, we shall see Jesus just as he is. The question for us now is, will our lives bring glory to him as we look forward to that day, as we serve God, by helping others as we have the means and the opportunity to do so. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many opportunities that we have to serve you by using the resources with which you have blessed us as individuals, families, and fellowships to help others in their time of need and in so doing to point them to you. Our world today has many huge situations that we feel powerless to do anything about. Yet as we pull our resources with our brothers and sisters in Christ in those situations and with organizations such as Tear Fund, Christian Aid and local Christian churches, we rejoice that many are finding the help they need, food, clothing, shelter, rescue, medical treatment and so on. Thank you for the practical help and care provided by our own denomination, PCI through the 16 homes and facilities managed by the Council for Social Witness, including Willowbrook here in Coleraine and Trinity House just up the road in Garva. We remember the various staff teams as they enter into the lives of residents and their families, providing the care they require at their most acute need. And thank you for many people in our congregations who provide practical support and help for neighbours and friends voluntarily as they become aware of situations of need in which they can help. Lord, help us to keep our eyes open for opportunities to help and to point others to you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Let's bring our time of worship to a close then. The words of go forth and tell. We stand to sing.
Thanks for joining with us this morning. Uh, I think there's tea and coffee. Am I right now? No? Yeah. Yes, there's tea and coffee uh, out here in the lounge beside us. If you want to hang around, grab a cup and have a chat together. If you have to go on, that's grand. We trust that the Lord will go with you into whatever situation uh, you're going and that you have a good week. And God willing, we'll be here next Sunday morning again to look at another incident that took place on a hillside in Luke's Gospel. So, Father, we pray that you would go with us now and that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and your love and the fellowship and help of the Holy Spirit will go with us and remain with us always. And the people of God said, Amen.